So good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Khalil Raza. I am the program manager at the Economic Cooperation Organization Science Foundation or ECO Science Foundation in short. So I'm uh, honored to be the moderator today for this webinar on behalf of the ECO Science Foundation and the Union of Iranian Societies for Mathematical Sciences. Uh, I welcome you all. And this is our seventh lecture in series on popularizing maths and science. Uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, uh, just uh, a brief introduction of the ECO Science Foundation. It's an intergovernmental organization of 10 member countries, uh, Iran, Pakistan, Turkey, and six member states from Central Asia, and including Afghanistan, uh, with the mandate to promote regional cooperation in science, technology, innovation, uh, in the ECU member country or in the region. Uh, so before we formally begin, I would like to make a request that please all the participants to remain muted. Uh, and if you have any question, and we encourage you all to have a uh, you know, thought provoking question for Professor Jan Han Uh So uh, about today's webinar, so today we are very privileged to have Professor Jan Kochantik, uh, Distinguished Dutch Professor of History of Mathematics as an esteemed speaker. Uh, a brief introduction of Professor Jan Kochantik. Uh, he studied mathematics and Arabic uh, at Utrecht, Utrecht University, Netherlands, and reserved, received his PhD in 1983 with the dissertation on Ibn al-Hatam. Uh, he worked in history of mathematics department at Brown University in the U.S. and the history of science department at Goethe University, Frankfurt, Germany. Then returned to the mathematics department of Utrecht University, where he became full professor in history of mathematics in 2005. Together with Professor A.I. Sabra, uh, Harvard University in the US, United States, he received the World Book of Year Award of Islamic Republic of Iran in 2005. Since his retirement in 2020, uh, he continues his research in the history of mathematical science in the Islamic world uh, in the Netherlands, and he also travels frequently to the Islamic country for lectures and workshops. Uh, so we are very grateful to Professor Jan Hochenthal, uh, and the floor is to you. Professor, I'll turn it over to you, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I just, uh, I just want to make sure uh, that you can all yes, hear okay. me. First. Yes, okay, good. Hear you. I, I, want to right. thank, I want to thank you, uh, your uh, Iranian and Pakistani organizations, for inviting me to give a talk here. It is, uh, I consider this uh, a great honor. The uh, subject of the talk is the relationship between uh, Islamic astrolabes and some modern geometric concepts. And when Dr. Ali Rejali asked me to give a lecture here, I uh, realized that um, when I started to work on the astrolabe, uh, these concepts were familiar to me because I had studied mathematics and physics. And so I thought it was very obvious that uh, they are related to the astrolabe. But I found that no one ever uh, wrote about it in the literature, but maybe uh, the contents of my lecture will be uh, trivial to all of you, and then I apologize in advance. So what we will do is first, um, I will try to, yeah, okay, it works. I will just show you some pictures. I assume that some of you know what an astrolabe is, and some of you don't know what an astrolabe is. So I will then try to explain to you a little bit about what it is. It is a medieval instrument. Then I will uh, introduce a modern geometrical concept, but only in a very superficial way because we have little time. Uh, then uh, explain the relationship to the astrolabe and then ask the question, so what? Uh, did we learn anything and is it of any interest at all? So this is the uh, structure of uh, my talk. And I think the Q and A will be at the end. So if you have any questions, uh, please save them uh, to the end. It is not necessary to take any photos because I have put the whole presentation at the internet. 
you, if you find it easy, you can already download it now or you can do it later. It will remain on the internet for about uh, a week. I did not have time to uh, draw many figures for this presentation myself, so therefore a lot uh, has been taken from the internet and therefore I do not want to this presentation to be online for too long. Okay, first about Islamic astrolab astrolabes. I will mostly show to you astrolabes that were made in Pakistan in the Lahore Astrolabe School. And I will quote from the magnificent uh, work of almost 4,500 pages, uh, Professor uh, Sharma's Descriptive Catalog of Indian Astronomical Instruments, which is available on the internet for free. You can download it from his website. This work has a general introduction on the astrolabe and it has almost 1500 pages on the Lahore Astronomical uh, School. So a lot of these uh, pages have photos and descriptions of Islamic astronomical instruments, which are all extremely beautiful or almost all extremely beautiful as you will see. So uh, I think uh, everybody in Pakistan should know that uh, extremely beautiful astrolabes were produced in Lahore in the uh, 16th and 17th centuries. I mean, if you look at this, this is uh, on one hand, a mathematical precision instrument. On the other hand, you see an extremely beautiful uh, pattern which has leaves and flowers. So this was made by Zia Odin, who was a descendant of the founder of the astrolabe school in Lahore. And the diameter is uh, only 100, uh, two millimeters. So on a very small scale, they were able to produce this magnificent uh, astrolabe. So if you want to read more about it, it is number A071 in Sharma's book, which you can download from the internet. The founder of the Lahore Astrolabe School, uh, his name was Allah Daat. He started his work around uh, 1570 AD. And here we have uh, one of his astrolabes, which is now in Oxford. You also see that the quality of the metalwork is extremely high. This is slightly bigger. It has a diameter of a li little bit more than 25 centimeters. The astrolabes were precision instruments. And you can see that because this is a photo of one of the parts of uh, Allah Dad's astrolabe. And you see a pattern of uh, circles here. Uh, but the circles are not really concentric. And you can see that because the spaces between the individual circles here are bigger than uh, the circles here. So something very complicated is going on here, which we will discuss in more detail in a few minutes. Now, uh, in order to try to explain how an astrolabe works, I will use a simpler uh, astrolabe that was made in Lahore by Zia Odin. Uh, this is the astrolabe which uh, we always use for uh, also for our workshops on abjad numeral system, because uh, the uh, mu museum in Chicago, which now owns the astrolabe, has put very excellent uh, pictures online. So basically what the astrolabe is, is a star map, which is the part you see on top with all these uh, little protrusions. The tips of these are all uh, projections of stars. They're basically it's the map of the uh, heavens with the stars. And this can rotate on top of a plate, which you see here, with the horizon coordinate system. I will uh, come back to that. Now, of course, uh, I am under no illusion that it is uh, possible to explain to you how an astrolabe works online in this way. Because what you really need to have is an astrolabe model in your hand. And we were very happy to have an astrolabe program in Lahore uh, five years ago where we had astrolabe workshops and gave participants uh, these models in their hand. I'm very happy that uh, Dr. Uh, Mubashir Abasi, who was there, is also uh, participating uh, today. So uh, to come back to the astrolabe, here is a picture of the star map itself without a rest. Uh, you see there are the positions of the stars here and also this thick uh, circle, which is the path of the sun. Uh, the ecliptic, and this is divided into the signs of the ecliptics, which you probably know, Kuz, uh, Jadi, etc. It starts with Hamel uh, with uh, Arius here. 
And so if the uh, star map turns around the plate, uh, what you do with an asteroid is really to simulate what happens in nature. Because what you see in nature is, uh, if you watch the sky at night, you see that the uh, stars seem to rotate around uh, uh, a center, which is the celestial North Pole. It's very close to the pole star. It's not exactly the pole star, but very close to it. So this process, which you see in nature, is simulated by an astrolabe. And this is why uh, some people who want to imp impress other people call an astrolabe an analog computer by sim simulating the process. So this is what you do when you turn the uh, the, the the plate that's sorry the the star map which is this and this on the plate and then you have a little pointer here which points to a number on this circular scale and by using that in an intelligent way you can use the astrolabe to solve many problems in timekeeping i have a small list here find the time of day from the height of the sun in the sky find the time at night from the height of a bright star uh, on the back of the astrolabe there is uh, a part called Elidate, which uh, I did not uh, uh, give a, a photo of, which you can use to measure the height of the sun during the day and the height of a bright, scar, bright star during night. So you get a certain number, for example, uh, 20 degrees above the horizon. And using that information, you can set the astrolabe. Then the what you see on the astrolabe corresponds to the situation in heaven at the moment. And then you can do all sorts of things such as find the time of day or time at night, find the directions north, east, find prayer times, find the Qibla, and this all without clocks, watches, and compasses, and all the things that we nowadays use. So, um, as you can imagine, uh, the astrolabe became quite popular in the uh, medieval tradition. Of course, uh, a metal astrolabe was very expensive, so not many people were able to afford it. Nevertheless, uh, uh, maybe more than 1,000 astrolabes have been preserved from the medieval Islamic tradition. Also in Europe, the astrolabe was accepted uh, after the 11th century on the basis of uh, astrolabes that were available in Andalusia at that time. So the monks in Europe started to draw astrolabes to study them and then later also to make them. And this is why we have so many Arabic words in astronomy because uh, the Arabic words came together with the knowledge of the astrolabe to Europe. Now, uh, I will be a bit more mathematical and a bit more technical. Um, so first, if we want to understand what an astrolabe is, we have to consider the celestial sphere. What is the celestial sphere? The celestial sphere is a sphere which with a very large radius you, the observer, are at the center. The radius is so large that the radius of the Earth can be ignored. So usually today we say that the uh, celestial sphere is uh, imaginary. It's something that we imagine in our minds. In the medieval tradition, people also did it like that. But sometimes they also looked at the outermost sphere of the universe and consist considered that. The radius of the universe was belie believed to be 20 22,000 uh, Earth radii, so that was also large enough to ignore the uh, radius of the Earth. Now, on the celestial sphere, we can consider coordinate systems. You see here a picture of a celestial sphere with an equatorial coordinate system. You have a pole here, and also a pole on the other side. So this will be the North Pole, this will be the South Pole, then the circle through the center perpendicular to it will be the equator. This is in the plane of the equator of the Earth. It's very small in the middle. And then on the sphere, you can uh, the, uh, define coordinates, uh, declination, which is distance to the equator. So it's 15 degrees, 30 degrees, 45 degrees. You can draw the circle of all points with distance 15 degrees to the equator. It will be like this. So it will be parallel to the equator, but slightly smaller. For 30 and 45 and 60, there are always smaller circles. The second coordinate in this case is our angle. So this circle you define to be the circle for zero hours. 
15 degrees away from that, you have to circle for one hour, for two hours. And so then you have what you call can call an equatorial system. Now, uh, we will not be looking at the equatorial system, but at the horizontal coordinate system on the celestial sphere. And then the coordinates are called altitude above the horizon of the observer. The maximum is seven, 90 degrees at the zenith. Zenith is an Arabic word, the Samt Aras. So because uh, the Europeans took the astrolabe from the Islamic uh, astronomers and mathematicians, they also took some Arabic words such as uh, zenith. And um, on the horizon, we have uh, directions, west here, north here, east and south, you cannot see because it's behind uh, the names of uh, your excellencies. The meridian is a circle from north to the zenith and then to the invisible south. The other coordinate is called azimuth. Um, an azimuth circle is a circle through the zenith which indicates a certain direction. For example, you can draw a circle through the zenith to the west, like this. And you see here this nice picture with the trees, etc. But it's important to realize that we are really talking about the celestial sphere. If you are here, the observer, then the horizon should be something like that. So it's another circle on the celestial sphere, not like the equator. But the coordinate system is essentially, uh, it works in essentially the same way. So it also has these parallel parallel circles like that. So um, what is an astrolabe? Well, let's first look at this very complex plate uh, that was engraved by uh, al -Hadad. Basically what we see here, this silvery circle here is the horizon. That is to say, it is a projection of the horizon because of course we have to do something with the celestial sphere. The astrolabe is not a sphere, so we have to map the circles on the celestial sphere onto the plane of the astrolabe. And this is the mapping of the horizon. This point is the east. This point here is the north. And then we have this point here. It's the point right above your head. So it's the zenith. This little hole here is the uh, position of the celestial north pole. So it's close to the, uh, it's above the northern uh, northernmost point of the horizon at a certain distance. And uh, the circles, the horizon, and also this circle from the east to the zenith and then to the west are were inlaid uh, with silver by Allah Dad because they are so important. Now what about the other uh, lines we have? We have a straight vertical straight line here. This is the meridian. It runs from the north point on the horizon through the celestial north pole, so close to the pole star, to the point above your head, the zenith, and then towards the south. The horizon is bigger than the astrolabe plate, so the south it con would continue like this, and the south would be somewhere here. Of course, they only uh, mapped the part which was really important for the purpose of timekeeping. So this is the uh, meridian line. And then um, the point the zenith, the point above our head, we all, I already mentioned. And then all these circles here, these circles which seem to be centered around the zenith. But if you think about it, this cannot be true because the distances here are a bit larger than the distances there, which means that the centers cannot be exactly in the zenith. They must be somewhere, somewhere here. They are the altitude circles. That is to say, circles of altitude above the horizon. And there is one for every degree. So if you take the second circle above the horizon, these are all the points on the celestial sphere which are two degrees above the horizon. And these circles are called al mukantar plural al mukantarat of course also an Arabic word. And then we need a second type of circle, so-called azimuthal circles, which give direction, like this one. Usually on the astrolabe there are many more, but in Allahdad astrolabe there is only uh, there are only azimuthal circles below the horizon, because otherwise the grid would be too complicated and too confusing. Therefore, he only drew them below the horizon. But if you are clever, then you don't need them above the horizon. You can do what you want also by azimuthal circles below the horizon. 
The principle um, is, uh, as I said, stereographic projection. Uh, what is stereographic projection? Uh, the sphere here is the celestial sphere. Here is the pole star. And opposite the pole star or opposite the pole is the south pole. That's uh, in the northern hemisphere. It's below the horizon, so you never see it. You use that as the pole of projection. You use the plane of the equator as a projection plane. At least we will do that now. And every point on the sphere, you join to the South Pole and you find its intersection with the equator. And that's the projection. So if you want to project this circle, you have to join every point on the circle with the pole, find the intersection with the equator plane, and then you get the circle here, which is a projection of the circle there. So then you get a map of the celestial sphere. And here, the map is on the right side. You have, of course, the celestial, north celestial pole in the middle. Then this circle, which is Tropic of uh, Cancer, is a smaller circle. Here is the equator. It's this circle here. It's the circle in the plane, which is the plane in which you map the celestial sphere. And then there's a circle here, Tropic of Capricorn, which is closer to the South Pole. And if you map that, it becomes uh, bigger like this. So that is how the uh, principle works. And yes, they were able to understand this in late antiquity when the astrolabe was developed and also in the Middle Ages. So I think in the Muslim uh, mathematical tradition, there are very interesting things which you can also use in modern education on high schools. This would be very good, I think. Now, see if I can. Yeah, so now, um, if we look uh, at the sphere again, uh, the point above our head must be somewhere there. It's not in the celestial pole unless we are on the North Pole, but we are not on the North Pole. So it's not the point above our head is not there. It's here somewhere. Our horizon is there. We can do the same sort of mapping projection from the South Celestial Pole and then the horizon, uh, the zenith and the altitude circles in the horizon coordinate system on the sphere, they end up to be something like this. And of course, you have to do a little mathematics to find out exactly where they are located, but this uh, can all be done. Of course. of course, also the azimuthal curves, uh, the curves for direction, they are through the zenith, run to the horizon, to the north, to the east, to the south, to the west. They are mapped like this. By the way, this is an innovation made in the early Islamic tradition, maybe by al Khwarizmi, although we are not completely sure. Probably it was by him, because uh, the ancient astrolabes, ancient Greek astrolabes, did not have azimuthal uh, curves. They only had uh, circles for altitude. And this innovation was very important, because basically it means adding the second coordinate and making the coordinate system complete. So then you can do much more with the astrolabe once you... Uh, are able to do that. Now, a uh, property of stereographic projection is that circles are on the sphere are mapped to circles uh, in the plane, and sometimes straight lines. And this is why the astrolabe could be constructed in practice. It's very important. Normally, if you map a circle onto a plane, you expect an ellipse or a parabola or a hyperbola. And that is very difficult to draw. But if you have a circle, this is much easier to draw without computers, of course, you, because you can use a compass. Once you have computed the center of the circle and the radius, this is very easy to, uh, to do. OK, so this is uh, what I wanted to say about the astrolabe in the beginning, although I uh, think that is in, to some extent hopeless, because one really starts to understand an astrolabe only by having a model uh, of the astrolabe in our hand and by playing with it and doing exercises. We have astrolabe workshops where we have these models, which are very cheap. They are just uh, made by paper and uh, plastic. And so we can make many models and uh, do workshops with that. Now, uh, the modern geometric concept that I would like to link the astrolabes to is called orthogonal systems of coaxial circles. So this is a geometric concept that was first defined in the 19th century. 
and it is of interest to us here because the almucantars and azimuthal circles on the astrolabe, they will turn out to be orthogonal systems of coaxial circles. So you have in this figure, you have red circles and blue circles. The red circles are one system of coaxial circles. The blue circles are another system of coaxial circles. They intersect each other at right angles. And so they are what is called orthogonal systems of coaxial circles. Now, this is a very rich uh, subject and a very rich theory. So I can never hope to introduce this to you in a satisfactory way in uh, 10 minutes. So therefore, I will glance over some uh, notions to give you some idea. And if you have, uh, if you want to know more, then there is literature. And also, it's very easy to find information on the internet. So this uh, concept was first defined in 1813 in an article which was called On the general means to graphically construct a circle determined by three conditions and the sphere determined by four conditions. The author was called Gaultier. He was professor of descriptive geometry in Paris, in France. The article was in French. And from the title, you already see that this has nothing to do with the astrolabe. I learned about uh, orthogonal systems of coaxial circles when I studied physics because they have important uh, applications today in the physics. For example, in the theory of electric fields. If you have uh, two electric charges, a positive charge and a negative charge, then you can look at the electric field generated by these two charges, I mean, if they are uh, of equal uh, quantity. And then uh, that has uh, field lines and so-called equipotential lines, and they turn out to be an orthogonal system of coaxial circles. So this is an important uh, concept today. Now, um, I will now give a simplified definition, which is enough for our purpose today. And uh, but this does not do justice to the uh, theory of uh, coaxial circles. So I'll define two systems of coaxial circles. The first system consists of all circles through two fixed points. Here's a fixed point, here's another fixed point. And we look at all the circles which pass through these fixed points. And here is the figure which shows some of these circles. Of course, there are infinitely many. Now, in this case, the radical axis of the system is the vertical line through the two fixed points. And I am not going to explain to you what a radical axis is because I can't do this in 10 minutes. But you have to know the word radical axis because coaxial, what does it mean? Having the same radical axis. The centers of the circles are on this horizontal line, of course. The second system is a bit trickier, but we can define it as all the circles around the two fixed points, the points in the first system which intersect the system, the circles in the first system orthogonally. So here you see a circle in the first, first system. It passes through the two fixed points. And you see here circles which intersect the circle in the first system orthogonally. And so they belong to the second system. The centers of these circles are on the vertical line through the two points here. And the horizontal line is then what is called the radical axis, although I'm not going to explain what that is. Here is a picture of the second system without the first system. I should have drawn these figures myself, but I didn't have time. And therefore, I plagiarized them from some books. Hopefully, uh, it will be possible for me to draw them in the future in a more uh, decent way. For those of you who know some geometry, it's also possible to define the second system without the first system. You, you take the two fixed points and you look at what is called circles of Apollonius with respect to the two fixed points. And each of these circles consists of all points P such that the distances to the two fixed points have a constant value. So you take a circle, you look at this distance and that distance, and the two distances are in a fixed ratio for all points on the uh, on this circle. But if you don't know about circles of Apollonius, it doesn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't matter. I mean, you just ignore in any uh, any way 
if you do not understand anything uh, I say, just relax and ignore it and try to uh, listen to the rest of uh, the talk because there are many pictures and you can look at the presentation later in email if you want to know something. I like to mention Apollonius because he was a geometer in Greek antiquity who was very highly regarded by the uh, Islamic mathematicians. He also translated his works into Arabic. He did not, uh, as far as we know, he did not work with uh, orthogonal systems of coaxial circles. Now, uh, in order to uh, make this a little bit more uh, specific, I also have written some definitions in coordinates. For uh, the first system, you start with uh, number C, which is constant, it's a positive constant. You consider the circles x squared plus y squared minus 2ax minus c is 0 for each real number a, so you have infinitely many circles. And these are a system, a first system because they all pass through these two fixed points. You can very easily see that by putting x equal to 0, you have y squared minus c is 0. So uh, these two points always lie on all these circles. For the second system of circles, you can do the same thing. But then the equation is a bit different. Uh, real number b. Now you you put b in front of y, not x, and then you have uh, you get a, a, a system of circles like this. It's interesting. Uh, the fixed points are again zero and plus or minus square root of c, so they are the same. But the centers of these circles are always above this one or below this one, never between the two. As you can very easily see from the equation. Now then uh, the systems are orthogonal and from these equations you can very easily see that they are orthogonal and I have written the proof in the presentation which you can read. Of course uh, it doesn't work to uh, to explain such uh, a proof in a written uh, in, in a spoken lecture but the idea is that if you want to do that you consider for example if you consider the point of intersection here you look at the center of this circle which intersects, uh, which must be here. And you look at the center of the other circle, which must be here. And then you can see very easily that the two radii are perpendicular, from which it follows that the two tangents must also be perpendicular. So this is very easy uh, proof on the basis of these two equations. So that should give you some idea that these things really exist. I mean, it's not just something that is made up, but it really exists. And then, um, if you look at the astrolabe, it's uh, easy to recognize the uh, systems of coaxial circles. Uh, for example, the azimuthal circles, that's the circles that pass through the zenith and also to the nadir, the point below your feet, are of course a first system of coaxial circles because it's, uh, you see they are all passing through the zenith. Uh, here I have a picture of an astrolabe not made in Lahore, but in Toledo and Andalusia. It was really an international uh, thing, the astrolabe at that time. Again, very beautiful, but not as uh, sophisticated as the uh, Lahore astrolabes. Uh, yeah, in the astrolabe, uh, which was attributed to Allah that by Professor Sharma, so it's probably correct. You can see the azimuthal circles are here. I have taken this picture because you can see here that the azimuthal circles also pass through another point here, which is below the horizon. And that's the nadir, of course, an Arabic word also, nadir, point corresponding to the zenith, this point below your feet. Uh, yeah, if you have this formula for the first system of coaxial circles, you can uh, take the geographical latitude of the locality for which the place was made, in this case, 25 degrees, it's written here. And for the azimuth, if you call the azimuth uh, theta, reckon from the north, and if you call r the uh, radius of the equator, that is this circle in the astrolabe, you can find the c and the a in the system on the basis of the phi and the zeta. And so you can just uh, recognize all of these uh, azimuthal circles in your system of coaxial circles. I'm just giving this in order to convince you that this is really true. Then the second system of coaxial circles, I think this is, in my opinion, more spectacular. It is this uh, 
system of uh, altitude circles around the zenith. Uh, the fixed points are again the zenith, it's visible, and the nadir, it's uh, below your feet, it's invisible. The radical axis uh, is also invisible. There is no uh, straight line here, but I mean, if you your plate is for the equator, then you will see the straight line. And again, the formulas become a little bit com more complicated, but you can do the same thing. And the formulas you get for B and for C are, they correspond to the uh, uh, values for the center and the radius of these circles that were computed in the Islamic tradition, uh, starting with Al-Farhani in the uh, ninth century. Again, uh, I hope that this all shows to you also that the Islamic mathematical tradition is really uh, complicated and deep. I mean, it's not, uh, sometimes people think that it's all very easy and it's not worth uh, looking at, but I think there are very interesting things which can be used, I repeat this all the time, to uh, really um, uh, enhance the teaching of mathematics at high schools in Islamic countries, because this is important because you can show in this way to the students in the high schools that some of the mathematics that they study was uh, invented in the Islamic world. And this is not that then this is not something that they have to accept from authorities, but this is something that they can see on the basis of their own experience. Okay, I am uh, coming to the end of my talk almost a few more, more minutes. So the first question was there a historic connection between the astrolabe and uh, coaxial circles? The answer is no. The uh, French mathematician who introduced his orthogonal systems in 1813 did this in order to solve geometrical problems. Here you have one of his figures. You see some circles in the second system here and some circles in the first system here. And you see it's getting very complicated, but there is no relationship to the astrolabe at all. And then the question is, so what? I mean, why, why is this interesting? It's just, why is this interesting? I think it is interesting and my personal answer to the question why is the similarity tells us something philosophically interesting about mathematics. Because what we see is similarity between mathematical patterns in different centuries and different cultures. The coaxial circles were uh, defined in Europe, in France in the 19th century. We find beautiful pictures of systems of coaxial circles on astrolabes that were made in Lahore in the 16th, 17th centuries also in earlier astrolabes. And so we have two mathematical patterns which are essentially the same or similar, and they pop up in very different times, in very different cultures. And so therefore, uh, this shows to us that mathematics transcends time and place to some extent. I am putting it cautiously to some extent. There is uh, a very interesting German philosopher, Matthias Schramm. He was a very good friend of Fuad Seskin. Maybe those of you who know uh, Islamic science uh, know the name Fuad Seskin. This was one of his closest friends. He was uh, also a philosopher and he said, mathematics and natural sciences seem to be a witness of the unity of mankind. I think this is also something very interesting and important. And you can think about whether or not you realize uh, you, you agree with this and philosophers can probably say a lot more about this but I am not a philosopher, so I will leave it at uh, this. Then the final question is, what mathematics did the medieval Islamic astrolabe makers use? Because I, uh, I have been explaining things in modern terms, and I have told you that the uh, medieval Islamic mathematicians did not use the coaxial circles, so what did they use? Well, we can read their works. Al-Biruni is one of the people who... Uh, wrote a lot about mathematics and also about constructing astrolabes. And he talked about this. He says, in stereographic projection, what you do is you imagine the heavens as a sphere without color and the circles you want to study, for example, this circle, as colored. And the eye sits at one of the poles, in this case it's N, and it sees the colored circles in the plane of the equator or a plane parallel to it. So the eye sees this colored circle in this plane. And this is for him the stereographic projection. And yes, he says this in Arabic. You can read this at the Wahana Jisman, 
Kura Tawahana Jisman. I cannot see the first uh, word, so it's a bit difficult for me. Jisman. Le laun lahu. So the, the, the sphere is a body which has no color. Wachatat alayhi adawa er al matluba bilaun nin ma. So the uh, desired circles are uh, drawn on it with some color. And then the position of the observer, maude al nadir, harija ala ahada kutbaini. So the position of the uh, observer is outside the sphere. So it means on the surface of the sphere at one of the poles. Tuma nadara minhu. So then it sees, it looks at it. Hatta adraka the tilka da wa'ir. So that until he sees uh, these circles. Ila ahat asutuh al muwazia. And so in one of the planes parallel to the equator. I, I cannot see the rest of the quotation, but uh, maybe you can. They could prove that stereographic projection preserves circles, and they base their proofs most of the time on Apollonius of Perga, the conic sections. He has a proposition on that, which talks about the cone with two circular intersections, which are not parallel. So which is the same what we have here. Then uh, the centers and radii of al Mukanta circles uh, were computed by Farhani already early in the Islamic tradition. And this is really the basis of all astrolabe construction because a craftsman really needs to know precisely the positions of the uh, centers of the circles and the radii in order to draw them. So here you see a table in the work of Farhani for latitude 36 degrees, zero minutes. And here you see the values for the uh, radii of the Almokantar and the distances to the center of the astrolabe with the values and abjad numbers here. This is transcription by Richard Lodge in his edition of this uh, and translation of this text. But then one mystery remains. I have always been talking about the orthogonal, ortho, orthogonal uh, circles. And the question is, did the Islamic astrolabe makers know that the Almukantas and azimuthal circles are orthogonal. Now, if you look at a plate like this, which was also made by Aladat, you see that the circles, the azimuthal circles, which are here, are very much orthogonal to the Almukantar circles, which are like that. So the answer will be yes. And the great historian of science, Otto Neugebauer, says yes, the instrument makers knew it. But could the mathematician prove it? We don't know because we have not found any proof in their work. The oldest proof that we have found was uh, done in Europe near uh, around 1600. So maybe there is uh, some hidden uh, mathematical knowledge that can be found in works that have not been discovered yet. Or maybe it was a type of knowledge that was known among the Islamic astrolabe makers, but was never put in writing. This is also possible. Very high knowledge that was known it was transmitted from father to son inside the tradition and was not written down. So these are some of the mysteries that remain when we study this uh, interesting subject. In any case, I hope I have shown to you some complicated uh, pictures and I hope you have an impression that the astrolabe tradition in the medieval Islamic culture was very interesting, also very deep, and there are very interesting subjects to study in relation to astrolabes and in relation to mathematics, and maybe also it can be used to popularize mathematics. In the end, there is uh, some literature again, and you can uh, look at it and you can download the presentation from the internet. So I would like to leave it uh, to that. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. And if there are any questions, uh, you can uh, ask them and I will do my best to, uh, to answer them. Uh, thank you, Professor Jan Wakantek, uh, such a fascinating lecture. And it, it's uh, truly inspiring the way that you demonstrated that about, you know, perhaps 10th or 12th century device, uh, you know, and it's such a huge contribution on uh, various aspects of maths and science and geometry. And it seems like it's an um, intersection of science, culture and arts together in this device. Yes, indeed. Uh, this is one of the interesting things, the artistic aspect. I haven't really stressed it, but uh, that is why it is so such a wonderful uh, thing 
to look at uh, Professor Sharma's work. So therefore, I encourage all of you to download it because you will be really amazed by the artistic quality of these astrolabes. There are hundreds of astrolabes in there. Right. And uh, so um, for the audience now, this uh, floor is open for the question. So if you have any question, please, uh, uh, we encourage you to post it on uh, the chat or you can uh, request us to unmute. Uh, so meanwhile, I I'm just curious, uh, so how accurate were those devices, uh, the astrolabs? How accurate were those devices? Number one question. And for instance, uh, if the if we wanted to navigate and find the location of a star, would that astrolab would be able to demo, uh, you know, determine the position of the star, whether you are in Saudi Arabia or you come to India at that time? Uh, so so the if, if so using the same device, astrolab. Mm -hmm. uh, at two different positions, at, at any two points in art, uh, were those designed in a way to determine the position of uh, stars or navigation or the, for the purpose that they were okay. built for? Th thank you very much for these questions. So the first question, the accuracy of the uh, astrolabe, I will try to go back in my own presentation. Um, yeah, it um, as you see, the... Uh, this, uh, these circles on uh, Aladad's uh, astrolabe, they look uh, very pre precise, but in order to, um, to investigate the precision of the instrument, one really would have to, to measure uh, exactly the radii and uh, centered positions of the centers of these circles. And as far as I know, this has never been done on a systematic scale. What I do know, however, is there is... Um, and uh, a historian of science in Turkey, his name is uh, Taha Yassin Arslan, who makes replicas of astrolabes. So he takes uh, historic astrolabes and then tries to make a replica of them. And also uh, he enters uh, the data on the astrolabe in his computer. And uh, he told me that the astrolabes of Abdul Aima, who, uh, who is an Iranian uh, astrolabe maker in the 16th century, I believe, were the best in the world, were the most accurate. So that uh, suggests that maybe the astrolabes by Ibn al-Aima were even more accurate than this. I was uh, always very much impressed by the astrolabe of Hujandi, who, uh, which was made in the 10th century in Baghdad. And because it is such a nice work of art, we always use it for our, uh, our workshops. But um, Mr. Taha Yassin Arslan was not very very fond of uh, Ahojandi because he has analyzed his astrolabe and he found many mistakes. So um, I think this is really something that uh, one would have to research. Because one thing uh, we have to understand is that not much research has been done on astrolabes. I mean, of course, much research has been done in the sense that cataloging uh, them has been done, for example, by Professor Sharma. So it's enormous work. We now have all the information available. But the next thing one should do is really to investigate all the, these astrolabes using modern technology and to uh, decide as exactly these questions that you mentioned, how accurate they were. So now your second question about uh, navigation and finding position of star. The uh, astrolabe consists of uh, various parts and um, one part is the star map. Well, I'll go back to the uh, to one of the earlier uh, things. Yeah, let's see if one. This is the star map. So this is uh, the astrolabe only has one star map. So if you have this astrolabe, for example, by Dia Odin, that has only one star map. It's always the same. But the instrument can be taken apart. You see this piece, the horse, can be taken out. Then the star map comes off. And the next part is a plate, which is this. Uh, let's have a picture for the plate. Yeah, the plate is uh, here. This is one of the plates of Aladad's astrolabe. The plate depends on the geographical latitude. So, uh, for example, this plate, it says here, I hope you can read it, Lihart and then Lam, which is 30. So this can be used on geographical latitude 30. So if your locality is on geographical latitude 30, <coughs> excuse me, you can use this to uh, find your location using the astrolabe and to find the location of stars. Sorry, that's what you want. 
but if you are on latitude 25, you would need another plate. So usually an astrolabe would come with several plates. Usually there would be um, seven, at least three plates, which were engraved on both sides. So we have, uh, then we have plates for seven different uh, localities. So then for navigation, that's to say, finding your position um, on uh, Earth, uh, it depends on the situation. For uh, navigation on sea, it is not useful because uh, I can show you this by going back to this pictures and astrolabe. You have here a ring and in order to make it work, you have to hold the astrolabe vertically. Now, if you are on a ship, the ship always moves. So that will never work because you need to hold it vertically and it has to be stable. If you are uh, somewhat in the desert and you want to measure the altitude of a star, you can use uh, the astrolabe. <clears throat> and if you then have a plate for your geographical latitude, you can use it to find the time. Right. Uh, thank you so much for uh, explaining it very well uh, in terms of their accuracy and uh, the the intended purpose of using this for different um, calculation, particularly in the star. Um, I, I, I got another question. So uh, after this, uh, the astrolabs, so did those devices or did these devices evolve into something new devices like sextants and quadrants at the later stages? Did these devices help in development of the sextants and quadrants um, I, I think to some extent, yes, but uh, this is related to the backside of the astrolabe. The backside is the side which I have not shown to you, which has the uh, rotating part that can be used to measure the, uh, the altitude of the sun or stars. That was uh, a similar thing was also used on quadrants. A quadrant is another instrument that was uh, designed in the medieval Islamic tradition. Later, Quadrants were also used in Europe and they developed into more complicated uh, things like sextants, where also mirrors uh, were used and that for use on sea. Then as far as the astrolabe is concerned, um, another uh, instrument that was used in Europe is so-called mariner's astrolabe. That is an astrolabe which you basically get by throwing all the interesting parts out. So you remove the plate and you remove the star, uh, the star map, and you only keep the... Uh, the scale and then also the part on the back side of the astrolabe. So in this way, yes, it developed into uh, into other um, uh, instruments. Of course, uh, after the development of mechanical clocks and also sundials, the astrolabe became less important uh, as an instrument for timekeeping because people in Europe, people started to use mechanical clocks for timekeeping. And of course the mechanical clocks were not very accurate. So they had to be adjusted every day but that could be done also by a sundial. And in that case, you don't need the astrolabe anymore because uh, the astrolabes were usually expensive to make, as you can see. Uh, after some, uh, some moment in history, metal astrolabes were not used uh, very much anymore. Of course, uh, people then started to use paper astrolabes and cardboard astrolabes. But then in Europe, at least you see the astrolabe decline very much after the second or in and after the 17th century. Okay, thank, thanks a lot. Uh, we have one question from President Isha Sir, Professor Tayyabi. So he is asked, uh, what is the correlation between Astrolab and the compass? Uh, the Astrolab can replace the compass because uh, using the Astrolab, if you look at this Astrolab, if you can, um, uh, if this is the situation at uh, the heavens now, and if you know the position of the sun, for example, if the sun will be here, you know, uh, from the from your dates and from astronomical tables, you can find the sun is in Akrab. It's in the sign of uh, uh, Scorpio at a certain degree. And suppose the sun is here. Now then you can see on the astrolabe that the sun is exactly in the south because that's the meridian. So that means if you look at where the sun is now, you see that the sun will indicate the south. Or if the sun is there, you can find uh, its azimuthal circle. And from there, you can find on the astrolabe the direction of the sun. So when you see the sun, you can then say, okay, it must be between south and west, so many degrees west of south. And then you can use that to find the south and the north. So the astrolabe can replace the compass. 
and also the compass is later than the astrolabe. I think also this is something that can be said. So there was a period in time when the compass did not yet exist, but people could use astrolabes for exactly the same thing. Okay, very fascinating. Uh, I think that that's the... Um, uh, we, we haven't received any further questions. No. So, uh, Professor Jan Ochantik, uh, thank you so much. Um, and uh, we, are, we are extremely gr grateful to you for, uh, you know, for this uh, wonderful and insightful presentation and lecture on Astrolab. Uh, thanks to Professor Rajali for, uh, you know, for the invitation to you. And so this is the, as we come close to, to for the today's webinar, on behalf of uh, ECSF and UISMS, uh, I extend my gratitude to Professor Akhantik uh, for his uh, thought-provoking uh, lecture and I also want to thank all the audience, uh, the participants for the uh, engagement. Uh, so we would continue to host a similar lecture series, uh, monthly webinars on maths and science and inviting the renowned and uh, esteemed uh, scholars like Professor Akhantik. Uh, and uh, so please uh, keep uh, keep, us, keep us in touch and we keep posting the next uh, events on our websites and social media tools. So thanks everyone for the participation and my, uh, again, sincere gratitude to Professor Alcante. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.